In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back, my brothers and sisters, to our journey through the book of Ezekiel. And today we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 17. This is an amazing chapter because the Lord is going to pose a parable uh, to his people, okay, through the prophet. And so this is an incredible example of how a parable is used in the Old Testament. And it's really going to help us to understand the use of parables in the New Testament. Not only that, the news of this parable seems pretty drastic, but along with this message of judgment, there's also a great promise of restoration. And so if you can find the promises of restoration, you will learn how to read the book of Ezekiel and all the other prophetic books. So without any further ado, let's get started looking at Ezekiel uh, chapter 17. And it says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, per, uh, propound a riddle, speak an allegory. Okay, now the word for allegory, it, the Hebrew word is mashal. It's probably best translated as parable. So I'm using the RSVCE and they have the words allegory, but you get the idea. It's going to be figurative speech that underlines a situation at the time which is occurring. OK, so propound a riddle, speak an allegory to the house of Israel. Say, thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings and a long pinions, rich in plumage of many col colors, came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. Now, you're probably reading this and going, what in the world is he talking about? Well, this is actually figurative speech of an event that's happening at the time. The great eagle, it represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and they're going to take away the top of the cedar. In other words, the king of Jerusalem. His name is Jeconiah, and they're going to take him to Babylon, and they're going to set up their own puppet king, and his name is Zedekiah. And unfortunately, Zedekiah, even though he has a cushy job, he's going to rebel against the Babylonians, okay? Well, maybe not quite a cushy job, but he's going to be a vassal king, and he's going to rebel against the Babylonians, and that will lead to the destruction of the city, and his demise, okay? So a great eagle with, with great wings and long pinions, this is, the, this is Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, rich in plumage of many colors, came to Lebanon. Now, why doesn't it say Jerusalem? Well, Lebanon was the place where cedars were from. And if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 5 and 6, you'll see that it was King Hiram of Lebanon who sent the cedars to Solomon so that the temple could be built, okay? And so he took the top of the cedar, okay? And this could refer to the most prestigious part of the cedar, and that would be the king of Jerusalem. And he broke off the, up, the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade. And it's very interesting that Babylon is called a land of trade a couple times in this chapter, because in the New Testament, when you read the book of Revelation, and especially the fall of Babylon, look at how it talks about the merchants and the trade uh, in Babylon, okay? And it may have been influenced partially by the description in Ezekiel chapter 17. Uh, and so, and set it in a city of merchants, okay? So a land of trade, a city of merchants, okay? You get the idea. Babylon is known as a place of commerce. And then he took of the seed of the land, okay, the seed of the land, that would be another king from uh, Jerusalem, another king of the Davidic line. So he's taken away the legitimate king, Jeconiah, and he's taking of the seed of the land, another descendant of David, and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it besides abundant water. In other words, he gave it a good situation. He set it like a willow twig, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine. So the concept of a low-spreading vine, in other words, this new king is going to be a vassal king. He's not going to be a high cedar and rule on his own, 
but he's going to be like a low spreading vine. He's going to be a vassal to the Babylonians. Wow, there's a lot of imagery in this parable, right? And its branches turns, turned towards him and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and put forth foliage. In other words, it was doing okay as a vassal of the Babylonians. It wasn't the kingdom that it was, but, you know, things were stable. The Babylonians were, you know, kind of supervising this kingdom. And the new king that they had put in was named Zedekiah, and he was a vassal to the Babylonians. However, look at the, how the parable goes on. There's a lot of symbolism in this parable. But there was another great eagle, and this would be the Pharaoh and the Egyptians with great wings and much plumage. And behold, his vine bent its roots towards him. In other words, the Egyptians are going to possibly offer to help out the king of Jerusalem against the Babylonians. You know, one great empire against another, manipulating a vassal kingdom. It happens all the time. And shot forth its branches towards him that he might water it. In other words, that he might give it support. And from the bed where it was planted, he transplanted it to good soil by abundant waters that it might bring forth branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Okay, so now the Egyptians are going to offer help to Jerusalem against the Babylonians. They're going to send them, you know, horses and possibly men. Well, at least that's the plan. Zedekiah, the vassal king, the puppet king of the Babylonians is going to seek help from Egypt so that he can rebel against the Babylonians. And so, verse 9, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Okay, what's going to happen here with this? Uh, will he not pull up its roots and cut off its branches so that all its fresh sprouting leaves will wither? Okay, and so you can see the parable here. You know, you're, you're, you're rebelling against the first great eagle, the Babylonians, you're trying to get help from this other empire, the Egyptians and their pharaoh, and obviously the Babylonians who are controlling the situation are going to put an end to this. That's kind of what the parable is getting at. And it will not take a strong, uh, it will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it down from its roots. In other words, Jerusalem has been so weakened that the Babylonians will easily, easily crush this rebellion. Behold, when it is transplanted, will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Okay. So in other words, it doesn't have the support to endure the harshness of nature. It's definitely not going to have the support to, with, with, uh, to endure the harshness of the Babylonians who have come from the east. And so here's the explanation. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Say now to the rebellious house. This is the house of Jerusalem, the house of Zedekiah, the puppet king of the Babylonians. Do you not know what these things mean? You know, don't you understand what this parable means? Jesus says parables often, and then he will often pose a similar question in the New Testament. Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes. So he took the legitimate king, Jeconiah, okay? and brought them to Babylon. And this happened in 597 BC when he went and took Jeconiah to Babylon. Ezekiel was also uh, deported to Babylon along with a number of priests and nobles from the land. He took out you know, the power, the people of influence, the influencers, he brought them to Babylon and he set up his own puppet king so he could easily rule this kingdom. And he took one of the of the seed royal or the royal seeds. In other words, he took a descendant of David and that's Zedekiah and made a covenant with him. Now, the covenant with him is very important because the modern reader will think, OK, it's a promise and oath sworn between two people, the king of Babylon and the puppet king Zedekiah of Jerusalem. But they are invoking their gods. They're bringing their gods into this covenant. So. In essence, Zedekiah would have been swearing an oath and invoking the name of the Lord as he made this covenant. There's a big problem here. And so he made a covenant with him, putting him under oath. So what's going to happen? Unfortunately, Zedekiah is going to break this oath in which he also invoked the name of the Lord. The chief men of the land 
he had taken away, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up. So the Babylonians, they said, look, you can have a kingdom, you can have your king, but it's got to be humble, a humble vine, not a lofty cedar. So you can see how the image of the parable, it, it kind of makes sense. It tells us what's happening in this situation. The Babylonians wanted a simple vassal kingdom. They would have allowed a Davidic descendant to continue on the throne, okay? even though he was a puppet king. And so this covenant, it would have stood, it would have, you know, it would have worked out in the sense that you would have had your king, you would have had Jerusalem, you would have had the temple, you would have had a Davidic king. However, Zedekiah, just like the people of Jerusalem rebelled against the Lord, he's going to rebel against the Babylonians. There's something very pro proverbial here, you know, just as the people and their rulers were disobedient to the Lord, so they're gonna, they're gonna rebel against the Babylonians and the Babylonians are gonna say, mm -mm, no more of this, and they're going to destroy the entire city. So he rebelled against him by sending ambassadors to Egypt that he might give him horses and a large army. Now the law of the king, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, it specifically says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, that the king of Israel cannot return to Egypt and ask for horses. And so this is a very specific violation of the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17, uh, verse 16. And so the Lord poses the question, will he succeed? Can a man escape who does such things? Can he break a cov can he break the covenant and escape? So there's a little bit of irony here because obviously they have broken their covenant with the Lord. <laughs> and Ezekiel makes that very clear in the first 16 chapters and especially in chapter 7, 16. And now in chapter 17, he's saying, let's up the ante a little bit. Let's throw in a little bit more on this. Not only have they broken their covenant with the Lord, but they've also broken the covenant with the Babylonians, the great empire of the time, and they're only a small, humble vassal kingdom. So what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> and the reader would, would, would say, obviously, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and they will not have a visible king. And that's exactly what will happen. The city will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed, and this will be the end of the visible monarchy because the Babylonians are not going to put up with this. And so verse 16, the Lord says, As I live, says the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who, who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, in Babylon he will die. In other words, you're going to break the oath of the king of Babylon. He's going to take you back to Babylon, and you're going to live out your last days in Babylon and die there. Uh, and it's very cruel because Zedekiah will be taken back to Babylon, his own children will be killed in his very presence, and then the nobles will be killed in his presence, and then his eyes will be plucked out. He will live as a blind man his last days, having seen as the last thing that he saw his own children being put to death, his own sons being put to death. So it's a very difficult situation to say the least. <clears throat> and so Pharaoh with his mighty army in great company <clears throat> will not help him in war. When, he ma when, when mounds are cast up and siege, siege walls are built to cut off many lives because he despised the oath and broke the covenant, because he gave his hand and yet did all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath, which he despised, and my covenant, which he broke. So there's a little bit of a play on words here because, you know, in chapter 16, we already heard that the people violated the Lord's covenant. And not only that, but the oath that he made with the king of Babylon, which would have involved uh, swearing an oath in the name of the Lord, you know, he's, he's also breaking that. So you can see what's going on here. Just as they have no respect for the covenants that they make with the Lord, they also have no respect that the covenants they make with others when they invoke the name of the Lord. And so you can see why it's my oath, my covenant, okay, referring to the fact that even with a secular ruler, they're, they're in, well, secular in a certain sense, because the ancient, the, the ancient peoples, they would have done this. They would have sworn covenants and invoked the name of their God. So 
with this pagan in whom he makes this covenant, this Gentile, you know, the Lord can even look at that and say, you're breaking my oath and my covenant because you invoked my name. And he goes on and he spread, he says, I will spread my net over him. And this is really powerful too. The word of, you know, captivity, spreading a net and um, putting a fish hook on them. It's really, really amazing because you see a little bit of reversal of this in the New Testament when Jesus says, you are fishers of men. Now you're going to go out and you're going to seek the lost and you're going to bring them out of the captivity of their sin. So in the Old Testament, and especially in the prophetic literature, in Ezekiel, you see this image of spreading his net over them and taking them away with fish hooks in its language of captivity. Okay, uh, so I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon. Okay, and enter into judgment with him for the treason he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword, and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. When the city is destroyed, you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. Now look at the promise. This is the key. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig. Now the image of a sprig um, is in the same semantic field as other agricultural imagery, which is tied to the theme of a new Davidic king. In other words, um, it has a messianic tone to it, okay? I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar, and I will set it out. I will break off the topmost of its young twigs as a tender one. And I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. Now you're probably thinking, where did, what does he mean by planting it on a high and lofty mountain? Well, this imagery seems to be, come from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, which talks about how in the latter days, Mount Zion will be the highest of all mountains. In other words, it will be the most important of all mountains, the most important of all nations, the most important place of worship, okay? And so it underlines something about Mount Zion, the very city that's being destroyed as Jerusalem is being destroyed. We're given this promise that implicitly, implicitly talks about the importance of Zion. And it echoes something that you find in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it says, On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it, that it may bring forth burls and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell all kinds of beasts in the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. Now do you see what he's saying? If you read the whole chapter, the first cedar that's taken away to Babylon is Jeconiah, the legitimate king. And there's a promise that, that this cedar, now that a new cedar will grow. In other words, a new Davidic king. And so you have to look at this in the, in the long term, okay? That the legitimate king of Israel, Jeconiah, is taken away by the Babylonians in the beginning of the chapter. And the Lord makes this promise of taking this young uh, sprig or, tr or twig from a lofty cedar and planting it on the high mountain of Zion. In other words, a new king is going to reign in Zion. Not the earthly Zion, but the heavenly Zion. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And so you can see how this promise here it's underlining something about the Davidic dynasty, okay? And you see similar language in, if you want to look at Isaiah chapter 11, you can also go to Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Jeremiah 33, 14 to 15, if you want to see similar language. And it says, all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, bring, the high tree, bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it. In other words, the concept of making high the low tree 
and the and making flourish the dry tree it tells us something about this king some some will say that this king will be a humble king okay the low tree being made high so let's look at our notes here before we finish this video the babylonians are going to take the true king of judah the legitimate king and his name is jehoiachin also known as jeconiah okay so jehoiachin or jehoiachin also known as jeconiah they're going to take him to babylon okay and they're going to put in their own king zedekiah who was formerly known as Mat Mataniah. Very confusing here, right? So they're going to put in their own puppet king. And their puppet king, Zedekiah, is going to rebel against them. Okay? And so the whole purpose of the parable is with the puppet king rebelling, with the city being destroyed, what's going to happen next? The Lord promises that there will be a new king in Zion. And that will be fulfilled not in the immediate future, but in the distant future. So the prophecy is realized in the coming of the Christ. So Ezekiel is presenting this riddle, this parable, about what's going to happen to the king and the kingdom. And I think that this is important because in the New Testament, parables are used to explain the mysteries of the kingdom. And if you look at the parable in Ezekiel 17, it's talking about really the history of the kingdom and what's going to happen in the future and how the kingship is going to be renewed. So there's something extremely uh, important about this parable. And it also helps us to see the purpose of the parables in the New Testament. Parables speak about the mysteries of the kingdom. You need to ask that question every time you read a parable in the New Testament. And so as we mentioned, the, great, the first great eagle is Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, the top of the cedar is is Je Jehoiakim or Jeconiah, the king who's the legitimate king who's taken away to Babylon. Okay, the the city of merchants is the city of Babylon, and what's really interesting is the second great eagle is the Pharaoh and the Egyptians who make an alliance with the puppet king, Zedekiah. Well, at least Zedekiah is trying to make an alliance, trying to get horses, trying to get men. He really wants to rebel against the Babylonians. He obviously doesn't see that he has no chance against the Babylonians. And there's something that's really um, proverbial here. You know, just as the people of Jerusalem rebelled against the Lord, so they're going to rebel against the Babylonians. And if they hadn't rebelled against the Babylonians, the situation probably would have continued. They would have had a city, a temple, and a king. But all will be destroyed because of this rebellion. Okay? So the parable here is trying to explain what's going to happen to the city and what's going to happen to the kingdom. Okay? So we go down a little bit more here, and I just want to go to the very end. Okay? So in hindsight, the covenant with Egypt is understood as a defiant act against the Lord's covenant with his people because the king would have invoked the name of the Lord when he made his covenant with the Babylonian, with the Babylonians. It becomes typical. It shows you just what he also had, you know, they had been doing against the Lord. They, they had been violating their covenant with the Lord. They invoke, the, you know, the king makes a covenant with the Babylonians and he violates that. Even if, even if he invokes the name of the Lord. So this is really amazing. Uh, the tree imagery in the Hebrew Bible is really interesting too because trees can metaphor metaphorically describe people or kings. For example, Judges 9 provides some beautiful tree imagery. Okay, Four types of trees symbolize four types of kings. Psalm 1 also talks about the just man providing beautiful tree imagery. The righteous or just man is personified as a tree that flourishes, okay? So you can see how the tree imagery is used to talk about a king, especially the lofty cedar, okay? So the high and lofty mountain where the cedar will be planted, an image of the renewal of the kingship, will be Mount Zion, the highest of all mountains according to Isaiah 2.2. 2. 
it's not referring to the physical height. It's referring to the importance, the spiritual importance of Zion. The reader should remember that the, the tabernacle was modeled on God's heavenly tabernacle. And so the temple on earth, the place where God dwelt in the midst of his people, was all modeled on the Lord's heavenly tabernacle. So the New Testament writers, especially if you go to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 18 to 25, it underlines how we have approached not the Zion on earth, but the heavenly Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is a very important point in the New Testament if you want to understand how this prophecy is fulfilled, okay? So kingship imagery in Ezekiel is very important. Uh, Ezekiel, a prophet, he's going to imagine Judah, okay, um, as in, in its king. He's going to see this king as this shoot, okay, this this um, you know new growth, okay, if you will, and you see this imagery in Isaiah chapter one. You know that from the stump of Jesse, from its roots, a shoot will come forth and blossom, and it's imagery of a new king reigning uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, and so Ezekiel is using what we would call imagery that's in the same semantic field when he talks about, you know, the twig taken from the cedar. So some of the prophecies that you might look at is first and foremost, look at Isaiah chapter 11 and you see the image of a shoot coming forth from a stump of Jesse, a branch coming forth and flowering. It's an image of a new king coming forth in the Davidic dynasty. You can also look at Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, and Jeremiah 33, 14 to 15. So in summation, Ezekiel, in the parable, he talks about the destruction of the king and the kingdom and the renewal of the king and the kingdom. And so when you read the parable, look for the last part, which gives you the glimmer of hope which will only be fulfilled when Christ comes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.